everyone. I wanted to make a quick recording of the introduction to respiratory disorders uh, so that we can get going with the screens and tests and getting into the pathology right away on Monday. So this is a pretty short introduction because um, I'm hoping you remember quite a bit from your respiratory disorder. So just a quick anatomical review. But going through the minimum learning objectives, the functional anatomy of the, of the lungs is pretty important. So the pleural membranes, the alveoli, and the physiology of gas exchange. I want you to be able to talk to me about what the methods are for diagnosing respiratory disorders. Um, the underlying physiology of the disorders discussed um, is really important. That's what pathophysiology is. So knowing the difference between um, pneumonia versus pneumothorax. V. There's a bunch of things we'll talk about, um, so we'll get there. Um, there's also treatment options for each of these disorders. Things uh, have some overlap with the way that they're treated um, with things like asthma or beta blockers or things of that nature, so we'll talk about that. And look, we're there already. So the structure and function of the lungs. The most important thing that the lungs do is gas exchange. And when I say that, that's the very simple exchange of oxygen for CO2. So we take in air, um, which is 21% oxygen, and the oxygen comes in, it binds to the hemoglobin uh, iron ring, this portion of the hemoglobin where oxygen binds, and then it travels around the body until it unloads. And once it unloads, it picks up CO2 in exchange for that. So then that CO2 travels back up to the lungs so it can be exhaled. So gas exchange is the most important thing. Also host defense, um, your lungs are coated uh, along with the respiratory tract in a mucus and a cilia associated with it, which is part of our nonspecific immune system. So when you're sick, you make more mucus than you typically do. That's because mucus and cilia are meant for you to stay healthy. Um, and they are upregulated to try to keep the host safe. Um, the final thing is metabolism. There's very few things that are metabolized or changed to excrete by the lungs. Um, two drugs of note that are, um, the first is inhaled anesthetics, which are interesting in that they only work when they're in the alveoli. So the way that their function is categorized is by MAC or mean alveolar concentration. So if you've ever been under for surgery before, there's isothane, there's halothane, there are these nice um, inhaled anesthetics. And the anesthesiologist might ask you to count down from 10. Uh, and if you get to eight, once they put the mask over your face, then you're pretty resistant to these inhaled anesthetics. So as soon as they're in the alveoli, they work. And as soon as they're out, you wake up, which is why you have injectables as well. So these are exhaled just in the form that they're in. So if you inhale halothane, you exhale halothane. If you inhale nitrous oxide, you exhale nitrous oxide. So volatile gases are removed that way. There's one other drug that's removed via the lungs, um, not completely, but a, a portion of it is. So about 92 to 98% of alcohol is removed via the kidneys. So the liver metabolizes it and then the kidneys help excrete it. Um, the other 2 to 8%, well, where does it go? Well, it remains unchanged, and it comes out of the sweat pores, so that when people smell like a brewery after drinking, that's actual unchanged alcohol that's coming out of their body. And the other place that the unchanged alcohol comes out of is the respiratory tract. So uh, that's how we have the basis of the breathalyzer test. What the breathalyzer is checking for is exhaled alcohol in the oxygen. So volatile gases and alcohol, they are removed via the lungs. So we can consider it um, in some natures an organ of metabolism. The lungs fill up uh, the rest of the thoracic cavity that is not taken by the heart in the mediastinum area. It is, we know the thoracic cavity is marked by the diaphragm, which is associated with the lungs. And the lungs are covered with the pleura. 
and the pleura are connected to the chest wall and to the diaphragm. So when the diaphragm contracts and pulls down, it pulls the pleura and then the lung tissue with it. So everything above the diaphragm is thoracic in nature. In order to fit everything in there, the body has actually made room for the mediastinum by taking a little notch out of the heart. So the right heart, or sorry, the right lung has three lobes. It's much larger. And the left lung, like L for left and L for like loser, because it is actually missing one of its lobes and it's missing a large piece of tissue in which the heart sits, which is called the cardiac notch. Just a fun fact, everything here in this picture is the lower respiratory tract. Um, there is a thyroid there. That's not part of your respiratory tract, but it's cool anyways. Uh, the larynx, so that enlargement, um, is what marks the lower respiratory tract. So when somebody has a lower respiratory tract infection, it means something from the larynx down is infected, whereas an upper respiratory tract would be anything above the larynx. All right, so here's the anatomy of the lungs in this slide. So we've got our right lungs with the three lobes, got our left lung with its two lobes and cardiac notch, and then we have the associated respiratory tree within it. So underneath the enlargement, this larynx, we just have the trachea, and the trachea is covered in these uh, really, really tough cartilage rings so that the trachea is always open. So we call that a patent trachea, or in the hospital, they might say patent airway. And why I'm making a distinction with the hospital is that any other time we say airway, especially in physiology or pathology, we're talking about the functional unit or of the alveoli. So the alveoli, however you want to say it, they're these little bunch of grapes. Um, there's millions of them in each lung, and they're associated with these small pieces of the bronchi into bronchioles, and the place where gas exchange occurs is the alveoli. So we call those um, like the bronchioles or respiratory ones, those are the airways. But in hospital settings, when you have to intubate somebody, they'll talk about um, an airway being open or patent. So in that case, they're talking about the trachea. And the trachea gets down um, where it eventually splits into a left and right main bronchus. And then it splits a couple more times into these associated bronchi. And then bronchioles means little bronchi. So we go from trachea to bronchi to bronchioles. And if a bronchiole has alveoli associated with it, we call it a respiratory bronchiole. If the bronchial does not have alveoli on it, we call it a non-respiratory bronchial or a terminal bronchial, meaning it ends with no alveoli. All right, we mentioned that the lungs are encased in pleura. So pleura are a two-membrane system. The first membrane is attached to the lungs itself, and then the second layer of the pleura is attached to the chest wall, all the way around the thoracic cavity. It coats every, everything but the mediastinum. I just kicked out my power source and had to restart this, but look how calm I am. I am a saint. <laughs> Anyways, everything but the mediastinum. And I want you to notice in this picture that the diaphragm is a bell-shaped muscle. This is a relaxed diaphragm. When there is a contraction, so that's going to come down. If I drew over here, it's the phrenic nerve. Let's try to do that little pen right there. Oh, look at how magic. So the phrenic nerve would come down here and it would signal with something like, oh, like <laughs> that looks great, acetylcholine. <laughs> <laughs> which will bind to its receptors. Uh, that looks really good right there, yeah, right about there. The muscarinic receptors on the muscle um, so that you have contraction. When the diaphragm contracts, it pulls down. And with it come the pleura. So they're going to pull down. They're going to pull down. And also the lungs, they pull down too. So, of course, there's a law associated with this. It's called Boyle's Law. That looks really good right there, Boyle's. So that has to do with pressure in a container. And so it, what 
this law states is when a container is a fixed size, there's a high pressure, right? So this is like a pop can or soda can for you other people. So when you just have a soda can here, the pressure of the contents are very high. If you shake up that soda can, there's our bubbles coming up in there looking really cool. Uh, the pressure is going to go really high so that if you make a hole in it, it's going to go all out. That's crazy right there. High pressure. But if you didn't shake it up and you just were a normal person and you have your soda in the can, when you open up the can, you have air flowing in passively because things go from high to low pressure. That's the way the gas is diffused. And then the air comes in and it naturally activates the CO2. So you get all these delicious bubbles. So the key here is that it's passive airflow. That's the way that your lungs work. Nothing has to do anything special. The only thing that is uh, going to take some activation is this initial contraction of the diaphragm and then it pulls down and then air is going to passively enter the lungs. And then when the diaphragm goes back from its contracted state, so a contracted diaphragm is a flat diaphragm, when it goes back to its relaxed state, now we have what's contained in here. This oxygen is under high pressure, like this soda can over here. So the passive movement of air happens with just this muscle contraction and then relaxation. So contraction is going to be uh, something that is active, where everything else, like exhale, is a passive process. Very good. Part of my drawing. That looked great. All right. So here we're looking up at a cross section of the lungs. And down here, we're looking at the lungs and the associated pleura. So remember, visceral means inner. And parietal does not. So whenever you have something parietal, like we had the parietal pericardium, that means the outermost layer, where the visceral means the innermost layer. So if you go through here, visceral pleura, that's the inner pleura. So that is going to be associated with uh, the, the lung itself. Then we have the parietal pleura on the outside uh, associated with the chest wall. So I guess these are supposed to be ribs or something right there. And then the pleural space is right in between those with its fluid. So I want you to notice here where it says low pressure. Okay, so there's something called transpulmonary pressure, trans. Trans means across. So we have inner pulmonary pressure, so what's in the lung, so inner pulmonary pressure, inner pulmonary, IPP. And then we have uh, transpulmonary pressure. So if you're down with IPP, yeah, you know me. What you need to know is that the pressure in the pleura, so the intrapleural pressure, IPP, intrapleural pressure, has to be less than the intralung pressure. If that is not true, if you mess up this pressure gradient, like with a stab wound through the chest wall, you mess up this intrapulmonary pressure and the intrapleural pressure, which together are the transpulmonary pressure, transpulmonary pressure. When that happens, that destroys this pressure gradient, so then the lung collapses. So the way that we keep these pleura, which are just very soft um, tissues, serous linings, attached or adhered to the wall of the chest wall is by this maintenance of the transpulmonary pressure where the intrapleural pressure is greater than the intrapulmonary pressure. Cool, I hope that made sense. This is a picture to show you why they call these the respiratory trees. So beginning at the enlargement of the larynx and then down the trachea to the bronchi on each side and then the bronchioles, it's like we're going from the trunk of a tree to the branches to then the twigs, where the alveoli would be the leaves that are on the tree. So the respiratory tree looks like an actual tree, and that should help you remember the different pieces of it, hopefully.
we call these parts of the respiratory tree the conducting airways. And just like a train conductor, a conducting airway is just bringing air, the conducting air, to wherever you want it to go. So when we start, I'm gonna change this to blue. So we're gonna be up in the trachea. So that's just conducting air down to the bronchi. And then the bronchi conduct it down to the bronchioles. And remember, if there's no alveoli on them, so see how there's no alveoli associated with this, we call it a non-respiratory bronchiole. You can also see these called terminal bronchioles because they terminate so that you don't end with an alveoli. So conducting airways goes from the trachea down to the non-respiratory bronchioles. The respiratory units include the respiratory bronchioles because they're bronchioles with alveoli on them. And the tiniest functional unit then are the individual alveolar ducts. Uh, we call one by itself an alveolus. So alveoli means many alveoli, <laughs> lots of uh, individual alveolus is. These numbers on the bottom tell you how many degrees of size difference you have between the original originating trachea. When you get 23 times smaller than that, you're at the individual alveolus size. So conducting airway, trachea to non-respiratory. Respiratory are the respiratory bronchioles and the alveolar ducts. Here is a real life picture um, from a very neat um, electron microscope. So you can visualize here these respiratory bronchioles. So RB is for respiratory bronchiole. See RB, respiratory bronchiole. TB is for terminal bronchiole. So those are the non-respiratory ones. So note the absence of alveoli in the terminal bronchiole. This A is for a single alveolus. So just one of these is um, where we have respiration. They are so thin, they're great at gas exchange. They each have their own capillary bed. Remember, this is the largest capillary bed, largest capillary bed in the entire body. And it's also the least resistant. So as I'm trying to chicken scratch this up here, this is really good technology. Resistant, uh, least resistant. So if you're resisting arrest, that means you are not listening to the officer and you are fighting them. If you have no resistance, that means you allow them to put the handcuffs on and go peacefully. So these are very low resistance capillaries. They put up no fight to letting blood through them which means they're highly, highly compliant. So if you're complying with the officer's directions, yes, sir, here's my uh, license and registration, sir. You have a high amount of compliance. If you are kicking and punching and not going with them, you have low compliance. So the capillary beds here, so just in case you missed that, we're talking about the capillaries. The capillary beds are the lowest resistant, highest compliance pathways or of capillaries in the entire physiology. All right, and this is showing you what's going on in each area. Hmm, let's try yellow today. Here's the individual capillary beds. So here's our, that's a light yellow, that kind of sucks. That's the original capillary network with our low resistant capillaries. Those are coming in from these pulmonary um, arterial systems. Why does it? Okay, I understand why. I don't want to talk about it though. Okay, so we've got venules, we've got arterioles. Uh, they're coming from the heart, so that's why the direction is opposite. Sorry, I got confused as I was looking at it. When you cut open these alveolar ducts, so all these together, this is a duct right here. So they look like individual grapes from the outside, but when we cut them open, we can see that they're actually continuous with each other or connected. And what holds them open from one another are septi. Yeah, we're gonna have to change that color. That's, uh, that's pretty terrible. 
magenta. How beautiful. The septi. So just like in our heart we or in our nose, we have a septum in each of those. So these are the septi that help to separate the alveoli from one another. In different disease states, like in emphysema, these septi break down, which means these collapse. It would be like if somebody punched you in the nose and broke your whole septum and your nose was just looking like this instead of like this, which is really a good looking nose if I do say so myself. Okay, in the alveolus itself, um, there are some cell types, which I really want you to know. So make sure if you don't know them already, um, you learn them. So first we have type one alveolar cells. Type one, allow gas to pass through them. So this entire thing right here, all of this, that's your type one alveolar cell. So that's, if you think about the grape analogy, this is like the skin of the grape. So that's what allows things to stay in touch with one another. And that's what makes up the structure of the alveolus so that we can have gas exchange in it. Then we have a really important cell, the type two alveolar cell, which in this picture looks like a little fuzzy monster. Um, and what it's doing is secreting surfactant, which we're going to talk about in a lot of detail. But if you go here, you can read about surfactant and what happens when an alveolus has surfactant and what happens when it doesn't. So moving back here, we've got our surfactant being secreted by these type two cells so that this alveolus can stay open. That's really important. If we don't have surfactant, this alveolus collapses. Also associated with each alveolus is its own macrophage. So these uh, are specific to the alveoli. So remember that the lungs are our first chance to defend us as a host. So not only do we have mucus here lining this tract with cilia that is moving it, we also have individual tissue macrophages to help destroy anything that got in um, that we didn't want. So I'm going to just talk really quickly about gas exchange over this membrane because taken together, this piece right here, this is what we call the respiratory membrane. So that means it's going to involve a type one cell, so our type one alveolar cell, a capillary wall, and they're butted right up against one another. So we call that continuous, but don't forget that each one of these cell types, because they're cells, they need to replace themselves. That means that they have an associated basement membrane with them. So we have a type one cell. We have a basement membrane of the type one cell. We have a basement membrane of the capillary, and then we have a capillary endothelial cell. And if you remember, capillaries are one cell thick, so it's really easy for gases to diffuse over these, and alveolar walls are just one cell thick, so that's really easy too. So when air comes in, we are going to have easy exchange of oxygen from the alveolus into the blood because we know things diffuse from high to low pressure. Oxygen in here is very high, Oxygen in the capillaries and the lungs, just coming from the right side of the heart, would be very low. Then, when we have done that exchange, the oxygen is going to come out. Then, what we're receiving up here is CO2. So, CO2 in the capillaries, dissolved in the blood, is very high, where CO2 in the alveolus, which was just filled with oxygen, is very low. So we have CO2 diffusing really easily over these, and we also have our oxygen diffusing very easily over these because of the very small size of these respiratory membranes. It's very easy for gas exchange to occur over this tiny little membrane. When this thickens, which does happen, so let's say somebody worked in a coal mine or they have silicosis or they're painters, what you see is that the alveolar wall starts to scar 
And in that case, it's really hard to get gas exchange over scar tissue. So when we say fibrotic lung conditions, it doesn't mean that the entire lung has become fibrotic and stiff. Um, it means that these respiratory membranes, those have become scarred and then gas exchange is, you know, not very good. Okay, so talking about surfactant really quickly, the way that surfactant works is that it helps act as a detergent. So the way that detergents work is that they break down the surface tension of water. And the way that they do that is by letting water molecules stop being so attracted to one another. Water molecules love each other. All they wanna do is hang out together all day. And the water molecules on the surface of something have a really high attraction to each other, which is why you see things like water forming droplets or things like these gross little water bugs landing on water and being able to float there because the water, which is, uh, you know, normal water, these surface levels of it have more of an attraction for each other than others. So that's kind of cool. So when we have surfactant, it helps break this up because if all water just stuck together, then what's going to keep the alveoli open? So in the same way that we use detergents to wash our dishes, that's what detergents do. They break down the surface tension of water. So if you put your, um, your pan here <laughs> with some oil on it, because you just fried up some bacon, and then you put it underneath the sink. I'm having too much fun drying right now. There's water going on it. So you know that the water is just gonna run right off of that oil because we have this surface tension, not allowing water to go mix with the oil. If you add a detergent like soap, now the surface tension's broken up. We have bubbles. We're allowing these water molecules to dissociate with each other so that you can really break the grease apart. So that's what surfactant does. When there's surfactant, we have this nice pressure gradient inside each alveoli. If anything destroys the ability of these type two cells to make surfactant, then the alveoli collapse. That can happen when uh, people are born. These type two cells, they don't mature until you're about 20 or 37 weeks uh, long. So if a baby is born prematurely, they're more likely to have um, alveoli that collapse. It's really hard for them to breathe. They're going to make a big effort for inhalation. We'll talk later about atelectasis too, and we'll practice saying that because if you say atelectasis, the uh, pulmonologist will laugh at you. It's atelectasis, like uh, sis. That's a case where um, you have collapsed alveoli. That's called respiratory distress syndrome. When something else gets inside of your lungs besides air, your alveoli are equipped to deal with air. They're not equipped to deal with vomit or water or things of that nature. So if you aspirate, there's aspiration atelectasis. Um, there's near drowning where people think they're okay, they go home and they die in their sleep that night. That's because that disrupts the ability for the type two cells to make adequate surfactant. So surfactant is really key for us surviving. All right, the final thing that is really important, we know that's part of our normal immune system um, is uh, this mucosal layer of the respiratory tract. This in the picture, this is a fun little cell here. This is our gut, oh, it's green, but I can't see it. That's a goblet cell. So goblet cells are named goblet cells, not after a Dr. Goblet, but because they look like drinking goblets when you look at them underneath a microscope. So the goblet cells over here, and whenever you find a goblet cell, you also find mucus. Goblet cells jobs are to make mucus which means they need to be associated with ciliated cells. Cilia, ciliated, cilia. We've talked about this in cellular injury. When there is physical change to the lungs, like in smoking, 
um, you start to upregulate the amount of goblet cells, and then you lose the cilia of these associated cells, which means it's really difficult um, for, if you don't have cilia, the cilia can't whip. That's the way they work. They use ATP to whip in one direction and then move this mucus. Moving mucus is called clearance. So when you're sick and you're making lots of mucus, you overwhelm the ability of the cilia to clear your mucus. So you have to do that yourself by coughing. Okay, cough. That's our own clearance. In cases of smoking and damage to the lungs, when these cells die, that's why they cough so much. They have lost their ciliated cells and now they rely on themselves for clearance. And this is what one looks like in real life. Look at these beautiful ciliated cells and these nice flat goblet cells making mucus. So that's what it looks like on the inside of your lungs. It's very, very beautiful and you should appreciate it. And this mucus does a lot for us. Um, again, it's part of our immune system, our innate immune system to try to prevent an immune response. And it's being made by all types of cells, especially goblet cells. And the easy part is making it in the upper respiratory tract, which remember the upper respiratory tract is anything above this larynx area, this enlargement, like larynx area, you know, like right here, larynx. So all this is upper all this is lower. So in the upper respiratory tract, we have mucus being created, which just goes downwards down the esophagus where it is digested. Um, these are the different folds up in the head. The mouth makes a little bit of mucus from cells too. And it's harder in the lungs because the cilia has to move all of that mucus up and around and down to get to the esophagus so that it can be digested as well. So it's really important to have those cilia clearing the mucus so that things um, are working properly. Okay, so the last thing that I'm gonna go through with you just very quickly before um, I'm gonna let you go so and talk to you on class on Monday. So we're in respiratory disorders, and really quickly, I just want to talk about signs and symptoms. So the first thing is cough. So this guy's coughing, and that is a really clear symptom and sign of respiratory disorder. So it could be a mild disorder, like you might have, a, a, an, I don't know, something you're allergic to, or a just a viral infection, so you have a cough. But basically, it's just a reflex to clear your lower respiratory passages. But you'll notice that people don't cough all the time. That's annoying and bothersome. It's only going to occur when there's something um, that needs to be cleared. So cough is definitely a sign and symptom. There's two types of cough. There's productive coughs and protective coughs um, are the, the good ones. We like those ones because they bring up the sputum. And that's a really gross word, but that's the word for um, the mucus, mucus plus bacteria that's either coming out of your nose or that's coming into your mouth because you're coughing. And the color of the mucus is colored by the bacteria in that area of the body, which will help you determine um, what type of infection it's in. So we like those ones. If you're sick and you're making a lot of mucus, you obviously want to get that out of you. So productive costs, we like to try not to suppress them if we can. A non-productive or hacking cough, that's when there's nothing being brought up. So there's no sputum, it's just a dry or allergic, a barking cough, a hacking cough, an asthmatic cough. People also get them from um, heartburn. Uh, we can stop those because that's just going to cause more damage, as we'll see over time. Okay, we've got Clint Eastwood over here. Um, he is suffering from dyspnea, which is Latin for air hunger um, or shortness of breath. So if it's difficult to breathe, if there's wheezing either bilaterally on one side and just one field of the lung, it's still a symptom of um, respiratory distress. The final one is cyanosis, which is bluish appearance of skin from non-oxygenated hemoglobin. So this little baby who would like to remain anonymous, 
um, has some sort of congenital abnormality where they are not getting good oxygenation. And we can see the cyanosis by looking around the face and around the lips. So that's central cyanosis. So cyanosis is when you start to turn blue. And that could be from a respiratory disorder or from a heart disorder. So just very quickly, I'm going to finish up with colors of mucus. Um, so first there's yellow and yellow is the color of the native bacteria in your upper respiratory tract. And our microbiome, which is our healthy bacteria that helps keep us safe, um, that upregulates along with mucus when you're sick. So when you are seeing yellow sputum, that's the mucus plus the sloughed off native bacteria from the upper respiratory tract. Um, so that yellow mucus is usually associated with upper respiratory tract. Green is associated with the native bacteria in the lower respiratory tract. So you get sick, native bacteria slough off, mix with the mucus to color it green. There's also, um, well, there could be red. That means blood. If it's bright red, we call that frank blood. And that's, um, that either means something is torn um, or something is obviously uh, really, really bad with the body. So obviously you want to worry about that. Um, I don't even think there's a brown on here, but brown could be old blood or it could be um, smoking related. And then the final color of mucus is blue. And blue is from a pseudomonas colonization. Pseudomonas. And pseudomonas are a bacterial species. They hang out on your hands. They hang out all over the place. And we usually have enough of a microbiome to keep them under control. But in individuals who are immunocompromised or they have a large access to pseudomonas, you can see that the mucus um, turn blue from the pseudomonas that have colonized it now. This is most pertinent in patients with um, a tracheostomy. So if they are having their trach changed by a home nurse, um, at home you cannot buy the hospital soap that contains triclosan, which kills everything, um, which is good for all of our immune systems because we want it to be built up and strong, but it's bad when that person is washing their hands with simple like dial soap and then putting a trach in that person. If there are pseudomonas on the trach, then you can have a colonization. So here's some fun mucus colors that kind of gives you something to think about. Um, yellow, green, red, blue, um, productive, non-productive coughs. And you probably know cough medicines. If they end in DM, that stands for dextromethorphan. So like Robitussin DM, that's a cough suppressant. Also anything that is an opiate, is a very strong cough suppressant. So in cases where people have pneumonia and they're at risk for breaking their ribs, which we'll talk about on Monday, we wanna give them a stronger opiate. But if they have a truly productive cough and it's not pneumonia, just let it be. It is kind of gross, but drinking lots of clear fluids um, helps, drinking warm fluids helps break it up. And there, believe it or not, is scientific data that shows mucus is thinned more by chicken soup than any other hot beverage. So turns out our grandmas were right about a lot of things that we may or may not want to acknowledge. All right, everybody, have a great weekend and I will see you on Monday. Everybody enjoy your, your times, your life your weekend, whatever it is that you're doing. Bye.